a pleasure to be here today to talk to you about synthetic drugs of abuse. Now these drugs of abuse are fairly new. We really had not heard about many of these drugs of abuse until the last few years or so. The public as well as health professionals have long been aware of traditional illicit drugs such as cocaine and marijuana and methamphetamine for example. And some designer drugs were created back in the 60s to avoid um, drug laws and to just bring about more potent drugs of abuse. But we've seen an explosion in the making of these particular types of drugs of abuse and so it's important to be familiar with the drugs, uh, particularly the drugs that the DEA has put on their drugs of concern list and also to be familiar with the pharmacology behind these drugs, the symptoms that you may see with these particular drugs and the treatment of overdoses or toxicities with these drugs. Now synthetic drugs are essentially psychoactive drugs that were created to avoid existing laws. Most of these are stimulants or psychedelics. Most of them when they're first developed don't fall any of the traditional laws that we have against drugs of abuse. Many of these drugs are very similar to the existing drugs that we have in that they have similar effects, but their chemical structure has been modified ever so slightly so that they are different drugs. And in some cases, that does produce different toxicities and different effects. We don't know a lot about these drugs until we hear about a lot of cases. A lot of these drugs have been used in Europe, and so we do get some information from case reports in Europe, and then these drugs make their way over to the United States. But uh, again, we don't know a lot about them, and it's important, though, to, to realize that these drugs are out there and to realize what types of toxicities can develop with these drugs. So we'll start with synthetic cannabinoids or synthetic marijuana. These have an interesting history behind them, and this is um, similar to the history behind many of the other drugs of abuse, these synthetic drugs that are on the street right now. But the synthetic cannabinoids were essentially developed by a researcher named John W. Huffman at Clemson University. Now, Dr. Huffman realized that there were cannabinoid receptors in the body and that those cannabinoid receptors probably aren't there just for drugs of abuse. Those cannabinoid receptors probably have some sort of action that can help medical conditions. And so in 1984 and between 1984 and 2010, he created approximately 450 synthetic cannabinoid uh, structures or cannabinoid chemicals in order to help in the research of multiple sclerosis, AIDS, chemotherapy, and other types of medical conditions that he thought these, these compounds might be helpful in treating. One in particular named JWH018 was developed in 1995, and that one is important because that's pretty much the first one that was uh, being sold illicitly as a drug of abuse. Other researchers at other facilities and other universities have synthesized similar compounds, and so there are many of these compounds that are out there. In 2004, SPICE, which was the first product that we're aware of that was being sold with these chemicals in order for, uh, to be abused, this particular product named SPICE was sold in the United Kingdom and basically what it was was a natural material, a leafy type material where the chemical uh, that produced these stimulant or these uh, psychoactive effects were sprayed on that material. Between 2005 and 2006, SPICE gained a lot of popularity in Europe and spread throughout Europe. In 2008, other brands or other products, K2 for example, were put out on the market and in 2009 these products were being sold in 21 countries at least. In 2009 to 2010, this is when we first started hearing about reports of usage of these drugs in, in the United States and the first reports of toxicity uh, were being called into poison centers. There are many different compounds and I'll just list a few of these, JWH018, JWH073, HU210, and many, many others. The, these first five were actually the first that were developed and we were first seeing in these particular products, but there have been many more that have been developed and have been sold as products to be abused. More recently we've seen such compounds as UR144 and XLR11. These chemicals are 
obtained in a powder form usually or liquid form in some cases and they're sprayed on herbs or spices or other types of leafy, leafy material and then packaged to be sold to be abused but they're packaged in such a way that there's they're disguised as other types of products and we'll come back to that in a moment the concentrations of these chemicals as well as the combinations that are in these products vary and you really don't know what you're getting when you do buy these products there could even be other drugs unrelated to the synthetic cannabinoids that are in these products as well. They're usually smoked, but they can also be ingested. These compounds act on cannabinoid receptors. They're agonists at this, the cannabinoid receptor 1 and cannabinoid receptor 2. Most of them are 5 to 45 times more potent than THC, which is the active ingredient in marijuana. HU210 in particular is somewhere between 100 to 800 times more potent than THC. So these are very potent compounds. They bind very tightly to these cannabinoid receptors. They don't contain THC, so the urine tests, your, your typical urine drug screens or tox screens, will come up negative when they test for marijuana. There are some specific tests that are available for these some of these compounds, but not all of them. But a typical tox screen that's done in a hospital setting, for example, will not test for any of these compounds. Studies have shown that the majority of users of these compounds report that they particularly use the drug to avoid positive drug tests. And then uh, most of these these users are also marijuana users and they often say that once they no longer have to undergo a drug test then uh, they go back to the use of marijuana. They may be undergoing drug tests for school, they may be undergoing drug tests as part of correctional programs, drug treatment programs to get a job, any number of reasons why they might have to administer a, a urine drug test on, on people and they will use this drug at times to avoid testing. That's also a reason that many in the military have used these compounds. There are a lot of different products that are out there, a lot of product names. K2 and Spice were the first two that we heard about, but there are many more that have been put out since then. Uh, Mr. Nice Guy, Black Mamba, Scooby Snacks, there are literally hundreds of different brands. They're sold usually in little packets or little vials. Again, it looks like a leafy material. They are often sold as incense or potpourri, and it almost always has on the label not for human consumption. And again, Again, these are uh, utilized as disguises for these drugs of abuse. The products are sold in many different locations. Uh, originally, when we really did not have much in the way of laws against these products, they were sold quite openly in convenience stores, in gas stations, uh, head shops, shops that sold drug paraphernalia. Uh, now that we have more laws against some of these products, and I'll come back to that in a few moments, you find most of these products being sold over the internet, but you still can buy them in some locations, some physical locations in storefronts. This uh, slide in particular will show you some of the packages that were sold in a store as well as one of the websites. There are multiple websites that you can find that sell herbal incense or herbal potpourri. They usually say on there that they're 100% legal, uh, whether they contain the ingredients that are legal or not. We don't know until they're analyzed, but uh, it's very easy to get a hold of these products. So who's using these products? Well, we found that mostly teenagers, uh, most of the calls that we get at our poison center as far as toxicity are in the teenage age group, but um, adults are using this also, and even younger children have been known to use synthetic marijuana. A study called the Monitoring the Future study that surveys students to see what their attitudes are about certain drugs of abuse as well as their usage of certain drugs of abuse came out with uh, some recent data on synthetic marijuana when they, f they first started asking about this particular drug. When they asked uh, 12th graders what drugs they've used in the last year, whether it be illicit drugs or pharmaceutical agents, most of them said they used marijuana. 36.4% said that they used marijuana. But second to that was synthetic marijuana. One out of every nine 12th grader had said that they had used synthetic marijuana in the past year. So more teenagers, according to this study, have been using synthetic marijuana as compared to your prescription drugs or cocaine, any of the illicit drugs, even the over-the-counter cough and cold medicines that we know that some of the teens are abusing.
2010 was the first year that poison centers were getting calls about the synthetic marijuana products and cases, and we received across the country 2,906 cases in 2010. In 2011, that jumped up to just under 7,000 cases. It dropped a bit in 2012 to 5,200 cases, and between January to July of 2013, poison centers just received a little under 1,600 cases. Now, there are various theories as to why the number of calls to poison centers have, have decreased. And we don't know the exact reason, but it could be from any number of things. It could be because uh, there's actually decreased usage, maybe, as the dangers become known and as they're not quite so easy to, to purchase. Or does it mean that fewer people, including healthcare professional, professionals, are calling poison centers because they are more familiar with these drugs now? They know what to look for. They know how to treat the drugs. So maybe poison centers aren't getting called quite as frequently because of that. We hope that everyone does call a poison center if you're confronted with a case of toxicity, but we know that that doesn't always happen. So there are a lot of theories as to why the numbers are decreasing, but nevertheless, it still is being used out there, and we still could see an increase as other products or other chemicals are developed in the future. The Drug Abuse Warning Network puts out data every year about emergency department visits as how it relates to what drugs are being used. And in 2010, they reported that there were 11,406 emergency department visits due to the use of synthetic cannabinoids or synthetic marijuana. 75% of those were in the 12 to 29 year old age group. 78% were males. In 41%, other substances were also used, most commonly marijuana, pharmaceutical agents, as well as alcohol. And in 76% of those cases, there was no follow-up care. There was no uh, hospital admission. There was no transfer to another health care facility or any detox program uh, admission. There was a recent series of cases that were reported in the Journal of Emergency Medicine, and I'll briefly describe three of them here. This is a 19-year-old female that had some jerking motions after smoking Bayou Blaster. Her friends reported that she had been having a, a seizure. When paramedics arrived, she was awake but agitated, and she did require physical restraints. She arrived to the emergency department with an altered mental status. She was uh, lethargic uh, to some extent. She would not speak to the emergency department personnel, but she kept repeating, is this real? On examination, her vital signs included a blood pressure of 153 over 84, a pulse of 116, respirations of 18. She was hyperreflexic. Otherwise, the rest of her exam was, was normal. The urine drug screen was negative. Uh, after three hours of observation in the emergency department, she was still somnolent. She was admitted to the hospital. She expressed depression and suicidal ide ideations, and so she was transferred to a mental health ward. The next case is a 17-year-old male that smoked a product called Humboldt Gold who was agitated and was running around in traffic and attempting to break out a car window with his head. His parents stopped the car. His parents were actually the ones driving him to the ER. They stopped the car and called 911 when he tried to break the car window out. His pulse was 134, blood pressure of 144 over 68. His pupils were dilated. He had hyperreflexia. He had a, a series of inappropriate laughter uh, alternating with, with silence. The paramedics subdued the patient, transported him to the emergency department, and he described being in multiple dreams, occurring one after the other. He said he couldn't get out of his dreams. His vital signs were remarkable for sinus tachycardia. He had a pulse of 134. He had a blood pressure of 144 over 68. And the examination also revealed flushed skin and dilated pupils. He seemed to be responding to internal stimuli. He was laughing a lot when asked questions or would be silent when asked questions. And he had hyperreflexia. There was occasional jerking of the limbs, but no obvious seizure activity. His tox screen was also negative, and the symptoms all resolved over the next two hours, and he was discharged. 
In the third case, it was a 19-year-old male. His mother heard him screaming, uh, and he was seemed to be hallucinating and very agitated, swinging his fists around, and he had some seizure-like activity, and then became unresponsive. He had smoked K2 20 minutes earlier. EMS arrived and found him combative with a pulse of 220, and in the emergency department, his pulse was still high at 180. Paramedics initially found the patient lying prone, but he did soon become combative and he did require restraints. On arrival to the ED, again, he was subdued, he was sedated, and his tox screen showed only THC positive in the urine. He did have a history of marijuana use and he had lost his job to a positive test. So it's presumed that he was using this drug to try to avoid any future tests. And he was discharged on the second day. The clinical effects that you see with marijuana, or, or synthetic marijuana rather, are very similar to marijuana in the fact that it does produce some psychoactive effects like altered perception and elevated mood. But because these, these compounds act differently on the cannabinoid receptors, they're more potent and they, they bind more tightly, we do see other effects unlike marijuana and they're more stimulant in nature. So you see nausea and vomiting, tachycardia, hypertension, chest pain, fever, agitation, confusion. They can be very paranoid and have suicidal thoughts. They can be hallucinating. They have dilated pupils. Seizures have been reported and also kidney failure has been reported. Most of the cases do okay and they can be discharged from the emergency department after a, a period of a few hours of observation. Is there some addiction and withdrawal with these products? Uh, we believe there probably is some uh, psychological addiction because there is some craving associated with the use of these drugs, but again, we still don't know a lot about them. Now, this is a, a graph of experiences from a variety of poison centers, a number of poison centers. The data from these poison centers was pooled to try to find out what symptoms were most commonly being reported. And among 1,898 patients, and this is between January 2010 and October of 2010, 40% of those patients had tachycardia, 23% were agitated and irritable, 15% had vomiting, 13% did have some drowsiness, 12% with confusion, and then a number of other patients had nausea, hallucinations, hypertension, dizziness, and chest pain. But again, tachycardia and agitation were the top effects that were seen in these patients that were being reported to poison centers. Now the CDC put out an alert earlier in 2013 about a number of cases that had developed acute kidney injury after using synthetic marijuana products. There were 16 cases reported in six states in, in 2012. They were, they were all different products. There wasn't one product in particular. They did have some samples that they could test as well as patient specimen, specimens that they tested. And they did find a product or a, a drug that they had, we had never heard of prior to this called XLR11, another synthetic cannabinoid agent. These patients developed nausea and vomiting, abdominal, flank, and back pain. They were all young. They were 15 years of age to 33 years of age with a median of 18 and a half years. They were uh, mostly male, 15 males with one female. The female was 15 years of age. They had peak serum creatinines of 3.3 to 21 milligrams per deciliter and their creatinines peaked somewhere between one to six days after their symptoms started to develop. Five of the patients required hemodialysis. So we've been on the lookout for some acute kidney injury with these products. Now we get asked a lot, are these products legal? And I'd have to say yes and no. There's no clear-cut answer to this. Initially, when we first started hearing about the problems associated with these products, there were some local jurisdictions as well as states that took action, and they passed some local and state laws. The DEA took some emergency action in uh, March of 2011 that named five of the synthetic cannabinoids as being Schedule I drugs. There was a federal law that was signed in July of 2012, and that actually named 15 synthetic marijuana compounds, but also had this statement in there, cannabimimetic agents also were included to hopefully cover a lot of these other synthetic marijuana compounds that are out there. 
In May of 2013, the DEA started to schedule some of the newer cannabinoids that we hadn't seen before. So they designated XLR11, UR144, AKB48 as being Schedule 1. Now, newer products are being developed with a lot of the compounds we hadn't seen before. Whether they come into, under the, um, these laws is yet to be seen. They may come under the laws as being an analog of some of these compounds, but it's unclear at this time. So let's move on to another drug group, another type of synthetic drug that we've been seeing some cases with, and that's what we call bath salts. Now bath salts are sold under various brand names, similar to the synthetic marijuana compounds in that they're disguised as bath salts, but they're not really bath salts, they're just drugs of abuse. But they come under a variety of brand names, Ivory Wave, Vanilla Sky, Cloud Nine, these were ones that we initially were seeing, but there are many, many other names out there, hundreds of them. They're sold in little vials or packets, and it's usually a, a whitish powder. The packets also say not for human consumption on them. These chemicals are not sold just as bath salts. There are a lot of other products out there that are these same types of drugs of abuse that are disguised as other types of products. And we've seen them in what have been labeled as pond cleaners, room deodorizers, plant foods, stain removers, shoe polishes, watch cleaners, meditation powders, screen scratch removers, ladybug attractants, and water pipe cleaners. Bath salts are what we call synthetic cathinones. Now there's a plant that grows primarily in Eastern Africa, it's called Khat, K-H-A-T, that contains a psychoactive compound called cathinone. And these chemicals are synthetic cathinones. MDPV, methylene dioxypyrovalerone, mephedrone, and methylone were the first three that we were seeing in these products, but there have been many more that have been identified, such as nephirone, butylone, flufedrone, and even more. These products, just like the synthetic marijuana products, are sold in uh, head shops, convenience stores, gas stations, less so now than when they, we first started seeing them here in the United States. Now they're primarily sold over the internet. And again, you will find many websites that sell these bath salts. Many of these websites sell both the synthetic marijuana compounds or what they promote as potpourri or incense along with the, the bath salts on the same websites. Very easy to find. In 2010, there were only 304 cases of toxicity reported to poison centers in the United States, and that jumped up to over 6,000 in 2011, dropped down to 2,654 in 2012, and between January and July of 2013, we've received 605 calls to poison centers. Again, um, we don't know for sure what the reason is for the drop in the calls. It could be because people are more aware of the toxicity of the compounds uh, and so they're not calling the poison center as much and that would be mostly healthcare professionals or it could be that people have just seen in the news that these chemicals are so toxic that they they're not using them anymore like they were when they first came out so we don't know if, for sure if the usage has decreased but based on poison center data it looks like the usage has probably decreased to some extent now this is a case of a 40-year-old male that snorted and injected bath salts. He had switched from cocaine to using bath salts. He was previously a cocaine user. He was very aggressive, delusional. He was uh, running outside, running around naked. He was violent. He had dilated pupils. His heart rate was 164, blood pressure of 131 over 72, respiratory rate of 24. He had a, a, a wide QTC interval with peak T waves. He was given two milligrams of lorazepam IM with no effect in calming him down, and that was actually even after being tasered by police. After five minutes in the emergency department, his heart rate dropped suddenly. He went into cardiac arrest. His rectal temp was 105.4. Blood pressure dropped to 70 over 32. His heart rate was 91. His potassium was very high at 7.4. He developed rhabdomyolysis, kidney failure, coagulopathy, metabolic acidosis, anoxic brain injury, and, and he died. He's, his urine and serum samples were sent to an outside lab for identification of the chemical, and they came back positive for MDPV, which is one of the synthetic cathinones. 
This is another case with a little better outcome. This is a middle-aged man that called police reporting people had entered his home and they were shooting him with laser beams and tasers. When the police got there, there was nobody there but him. He had been using something called synthetic cocaine that was actually labeled as white horse uh, concentrated bath salts, and he'd been using that for a week. In the emergency department, he was very hyperactive, paranoid. He had some visual and auditory hallucinations, and he required being admitted to the psychiatric unit for three days where he was treated with haloperidol. Bath salts inhibit serotonin and catecholamine reuptake and transporters, so dopamine and norepinephrine reuptake uh, transporters. The symptoms that you see, again, are very stimulant-like in nature, very similar to what you would see with cocaine or an amphetamine. They do develop a lot of paranoia and delusions and hallucinations, uh, violent behavior, suicidal thoughts, and that can last for several days. They have tachycardia usually, they can have hypertension, hyperthermia, they sweat a lot, dilated pupils, they can also have seizures. There are case reports of serotonin syndrome developing because of the excess serotonin due to the inhibition of the reuptake transporters. They also have, we have some case reports of compartment syndrome when it's been injected. And also we feel that there's, there's, there's probably some sort of addiction and withdrawal potential with the um, chronic usage of these drugs. When we look at the Poison Center's experience, this is from the Carolinas Poison Center in North Carolina, and it looks at their cases between January 2010 and December of 2011, and with the bath salts cases, 409 cases, they had 53% of those having tachycardia, 50% with agitation and irritability, 27% with hallucinations, 25% with hypertension, in 20% there was CPK elevation, 15% confusion, and then also they, uh, some of them had drowsiness, tremor, electrolyte abnormalities, hyperventilation, and rhabdomyolysis. Most of your urine tox screens or drug screens will not test for any of these compounds. They don't test for any of these synthetic cathinones. There is some specific testing available. Usually the samples would have to be sent to outside labs. The samples can be urine, blood, even oral fluid and these samples also may come back negative even if they've used these products because most of these labs only test for a few of those synthetic cathinones. So if it just depends on what's in that product and we never know that because it's not labeled as such. Uh, so it's, it's anybody's guess as to whether they'll have a positive tox screen or not when it's sent out. But definitely when, it's in, when the tox screen is in the emergency department, when that's being done uh, in hospital, it will come up negative for the bath salts. Now, are these drugs illegal? Well, just like the synthetic marijuana compounds, there was some action taken by local uh, municipalities as well as states to make them illegal. And then the DEA took some emergency action in September of, of 2011 and it designated mephedrone, methylone, and MDPV as Schedule 1. This new federal law that was signed in July of, of 2012 named MDPV and mephedrone as being illegal and, and that's it when it came to the synthetic cathinones. The DEA in May of 2013 named methylone as being a Schedule I drug, but again, it, it may not cover some of these other synthetic cathinones that are in these products. Now, ecstasy is not a new drug. It's been around for a while, but it is a, a synthetic drug. It's methylene dioxymethamphetamine that stimulates the release of and inhibits the reuptake and breakdown of serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. It produces euphoria. It produ produces uh, increased empathy for other people and self-confidence. And it also increases the intensity of lights and sounds. And so it's often used as a party drug at rave parties in particular. We're seeing a big increase in the usage of ecstasy in, in some areas of the country. According to the Drug Abuse Warning Network, there was a 235% increase in the number of emergency department visits involving MDMA or ecstasy between 2004 and 2010. MDMA was initially popular among white adolescents and young adults in the nightclub scene or at these dance parties, but the drug now affects a broader range of users and ethnicities. 
It usually comes in a tablet form that has a logo on it, but the logo really doesn't mean anything as far as determining what's in the drug or how much. The dosage can be quite different from one tablet to the next. And in, in the past, when they've actually analyzed these tablets, as many as 50% of the tablets didn't contain MDMA or ecstasy at all. And they contained all different types of drugs. So we really don't know what's in the tablet based on what the tablet looks like. Because the, the ecstasy produces some jaw clenching and teeth grinding, there is some paraphernalia that's used by ecstasy users, usually something like a pacifier or a whistle to decrease jaw clenching and teeth grinding. There are often light sticks that the um, teenager or young adult is twirling around so that they can see the trails or tracers of lights. A lot of colorful clothes and also they do have dilated pupils as you can see probably in this picture. Toxic effects include hallucinations, agitation and psychosis, seizures have occurred, dilated pupils, tachycardia, ventricular arrhythmias, hypertension, prolonged QT interval. They sweat a lot, and so they can become dehydrated. They can develop the syndrome of inappropriate diuretic hormone, or SIADH, which leads to hyponatremia, but also at a lot of these parties, these kids are encouraged to drink a lot of water to reverse the dehydration that they can get from the drug as well as from all the dancing that they're doing and the sweating. So some of the kids come in water intoxicated and so they can have hyponatremia from that. A low sodium level will result in vomiting, muscle cramps, and altered mental status and coma. But many of these patients, if they die, it's primarily due to hyperthermia and the effects secondary to hyperthermia. They can develop rhabdomyolysis and renal failure, coagulopathy, and seizures that can lead to death. Another drug that we've been hearing a lot about, or at least a slang name, is Molly. Uh, this is a very common slang name, and it, it's we're not really sure exactly what it refers to in some areas, but it, historically it's referred to ecstasy or MDMA. It also has been used to refer to another drug called TFMPP, which is illegal only in some states, not federally. It's a drug that's usually used with another drug called benzylpiprazine or other drugs as an ecstasy substitute. Molly can also refer to the combination of ecstasy and LSD. But in any event, with any of these, you're going to see very similar effects in that you'll see stimulant effects as well as hallucinations. Now this is a case report that's interesting. It's a 24-year-old female that took two capsules of ecstasy at a concert. Medics found her unconscious and she had a heart rate of 132, a blood pressure of 80 over 60, and she did have seizures. In the emergency department, she was in a coma. Her temperature was 107.2 Fahrenheit. Her pulse was 158, respiratory rate of 34. Blood pressure was 101 over 61, and she had some tremors. She developed bleeding, uh, hyperreflexia, an ARDS, a pulmonary injury. Uh, she developed renal failure, and she died 48 hours after presentation. The cause of death was deemed to be serotonin syndrome. The capsule and her urine were analyzed and both showed methylone and butylone, which are synthetic cathinones. So these are the bath salts chemicals, and the product did not contain ecstasy at all. It contained the synthetic cathinones. So another indication that we just don't know what are in these products when patients come in and if there are people out there buying these products, they really have no idea what's in them. There's another group of drugs that we're seeing an increase in use of called the 2C drugs. There are 27 known compounds that fall under this classification. 2CE, 2CI, 2CP, 2CC, these are all commonly being seen in some areas as ecstasy substitutes. They go under a lot of different slang names, Smiles, Mr. Nice Guy, infinity. There are a number of slang names out there and they're most often used by young adults and teens who use ecstasy. They are illegal uh, for the most part but we've still seen an increase in usage in some areas. Our Poison Center received an alert from the Philadelphia and Camden law enforcement agencies that they had seen a spike in the usage of these drugs in their area and again they were they found out that most of these users were young ecstasy users
The 2C drugs increase dopamine and serotonin release and to a lesser extent norepinephrine. They produce stimulant and hallucinogenic effects. Also teeth grinding, smiling, audio stimulation, and uh, they look very much like ecstasy in their clinical effects. They are undetectable on your current drug screens. This is a case of a 2,5-I exposure, another uh, synthetic drug of abuse that we're starting to hear about. This is an 18-year-old that was brought to the emergency department by police after jumping out of a moving car. He had severe agitation, hallucinations, dilated pupils. His heart rate was in the 150s. His blood pressure was 150 to 170 over 110. And he did not have a um, fever. He said he used 2,5-I or 25-I. His tox screen was only positive for cannabinoids, so he had been using marijuana as well. He was given 4 milligrams of lorazepam and became alert, and he did require a lorazepam infusion to sedate him. His vital signs were normal 12 hours later, but he did require lorazepam and restraints for three days to control his agitation. Another similar drug is 2,5-I-N-B-O-M-E. It's related to the drug 2CI. It's a potent serotonin agonist. It's a stimulant drug that has sim uh, stimulant drug that has psychedelic effects as well, or hallucinogenic effects at very very low doses. It's very potent. Some of the slang names include Smiles and N Bomb. It's so potent that often it's just uh, impregnated on blotter paper that the user will ingest or lick. Can also be used intranasally as well as by other routes, even smoked. There have been 11 um, non-fatal overdoses that were reported in Richmond, Virginia and Michigan in, in 2012 that were reported in the literature. And they had prolonged seizures, rhabdomyolysis, and renal failure. There have also been deaths that have been reported in at least Minnesota and Arkansas. Again, these were in the literature. PMA and PMMA are two drugs that are, again, ecstasy uh, substitutes. They are hallucinogenic stimulants. They're often sold as ecstasy. We feel that there might be a higher incidence of severe toxicity reported when PMA or, or PMMA are in these particular tablets because it has a slow onset, and so users tend to use more to get the effect that they used to get when they used ecstasy. So they use higher doses at times and they can develop arrhythmias, respiratory failure, renal failure, seizures, hyperthermia, and there have been fatalities. Bromo dragonfly is another synthetic drug. It goes by the slang names Placid, Fly, or ABDF. And if you look at the chemical, stru chemical structure there, you might be able to figure out why it gets its name as Bromo Dragonfly. It's a benzodifurian, which is an, another group of drugs that are synthetic drugs. It's a serotonin and an alpha-1 adrenergic receptor agonist. So it's a little bit different than some of the other synthetic stimulants. It's very potent. It has a long duration of action, a few days. In, in cases, primarily in Europe, we haven't seen a lot in the United States, but in Europe they're having cases of limb ischemia from peripheral vasoconstriction and some cases have actually required amputations due to gangrene. There have been some overdose deaths in our country due to misidentification of this drug as a less potent 2C drug, and so the, there have been basically dosage errors giving too much of this drug thinking that it is a 2C drug. A new group of drugs that we're just starting to hear about, about are the benzofurans, um, 6-APB, 5-APB, 5-EAPB, and there are others. These are analogs of methylene dioxyamphetamine, so very similar to ecstasy, which is methylene dioxymethamphetamine. They're monoamine reuptake inhibitors, and they're also potent serotonin agonists. Cases have been reported in Europe just since 2010. One case report that recently came out in 2013 was of a 21-year-old that had no medical or psychiatric history that developed agitation and, and paranoia after using 6-APB that was purchased over the internet from a chemical supply company. The patient used marijuana regularly on weekends and used this drug instead. It was the first use of this drug. He was cutting his arms with a razor blade and so his friends were, brought him to the emergency department. 
he was agitated. He complained that everyone there was trying to read his mind, so he seemed to be very paranoid. He uh, required diazepam to control his agitation throughout his hospitalization, and he was admitted to a psychiatric facility for psychosis, which, which actually worsened on the second day of admission. But he did improve, and he was discharged three days after being admitted to the psych unit. Now, treatment of the synthetic drugs all of these synthetic stimulants is basically the same. It, re it requires supportive care and primarily benzodiazepines. Any of the benzodiazepines for sedation can lower their heart rate, it can lower their blood pressure, it can lower their temperature, and also act as an anticonvulsant. We need to aggressively cool them off if they're hyperthermic because that can lead to death. As far as antipsychotic agents, Haldol should be used with caution because it can lower, uh, theoretically lower the seizure threshold. Haldol also has anticholinergic effects, so it might increase the blood pressure and the heart rate further. And there have been reports with IV use of, of haloperidol of QT prolongation. So it's not completely contraindicated, but in the acute phase of the overdose, it, it should be used with caution, if at all. Some of the other antipsychotics have been used, the atypical antipsychotics like olanzapine or zyprazidone, for example, and certainly there is a role for them in some cases of severe agitation, paranoia, and psychosis. Another drug, a synthetic drug, that is a little bit different is called MXE or methoxetamine. This is a 19-year-old that injected MXE. IV shortly before he was discharged from a detox facility. So somehow he got it into the detox facility. 30 minutes later, he had extreme agitation, very ataxic, so stumbling around, and he was disoriented to time and place. His blood pressure was 168 over 77, pulse of 134. His temperature was 99.7 Fahrenheit. He had dilated pupils, nystagmus. He was given midazolam and diazepam, which did result in some less agitation. His blood pressure dropped to 86 over 48. His pulse decreased to 106. And the next morning, he was transferred to the psych unit with mild agitation. Now, methoxetamine is also known on the street as MXE or MCET, MEXI. Uh, there are a number of slang names for methoxetamine. It's a ketamine analog. So it's very similar to ketamine, only it's more potent. It's also very similar to PCP or fencyclidine, but less potent. So it's somewhere between ketamine and fencyclidine. It's an NMDA receptor antagonist like ketamine and fencyclidine. It also does have some serotonin and dopamine reuptake inhibitor activity. It can be snorted, it can be injected. We don't know a lot about it yet. There aren't a lot of case, case reports with this drug currently, but the ones that have been in the literature have shown that they've developed tachycardia, agitation, a dissociative state, like is, again as seen with ketamine and, and PCP, nystagmus, dilated pupils, and there was one case report in the literature of cerebellar ataxia that was pretty severe. We do know it's making its way into our country, however. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of cases, but there was a shipment that was see seized in Philadelphia in February of 2012. So we are on the lookout for this drug as well. Now you might remember that back in 2005 through early 2007, there was an epidemic of fatalities from illicitly produced fentanyl in the United States. There were more than 1,000 fatalities, mostly in Chicago, Detroit, and Philadelphia, but many other states, including my state of Maryland, reported cases as well. It was sold on the street in combination with or in place of heroin. Now, more recently, just in early of 2013, we've seen an outbreak of overdose cases in IV drug abusers with fentanyl as well as a, another a synthetic analog called acetylfentanyl. Now the acetylfentanyl or the fentanyl is mixed or has been mixed with heroin or it has been in products or samples sold as heroin alone without any heroin in it. There were 15 fatalities in Rhode Island between March and June of 2013 due to acetylfentanyl alone. And in Pennsylvania, between January and June of 2013, there were 50 fatalities due to acetylfentanyl or fentanyl. 
Acetylfentanyl is more potent than heroin. It's a, um, at least five times more potent. Fentanyl is much more potent than heroin. It's at least 50 times more potent than heroin. So it's very easy for people to overdose by um, making dosage errors, really, when they're either distributing the drug or using the drug. It does require larger doses of naloxone to reverse the effects larger than what you would expect with heroin. And most urine tox screens don't test for these drugs. You can ask for specific testing for fentanyl, and then if that comes back positive, then there are a few outside labs that will test for acetylfentanyl. So that's a possibility to narrow it down. Let's talk about naloxone for a bit. Naloxone will reverse the effects of acetylfentanyl and fentanyl as well as other opioid and other opioid drugs and analgesics. It will reverse the central nervous system and respiratory depression. The dose is 0.4 to 2 milligrams IV or IM, or it can be given intranasally as well, an atomizer put on the syringe and squirt it up the nose. If it's given intranasally, there, there's only so much volume you can put up the nose and get absorption with that. The rest will drip down the back of the throat. So we like to make sure there's, a, there's less than one milliliter per nostril and split the dose, put half the dose in each nostril. It has a short duration of action of less than one and a half hours. And so for long-acting opioids, we put them on an infusion that's usually not required for heroin or fentanyl. Uh, it can precipitate withdrawal in opioid users. As far as the future, uh, we feel that in some cases lower doses for some of the opioids can be used. Again, though, with the acetylfentanyl and fentanyl, you need large doses. Intranasal use is being given more and more by first responders, even police as well as paramedics and in emergency departments, uh, so it's more widely available. There are companies working on possibly a different formulation for intranasal naloxone, a more concentrated form, so you would use less liquid, less product in the nose. And also there's a push to make intranasal naloxone over the counter. There are many resources you can go to to get more information about these synthetic drugs, but the National Institute on Drug Abuse, or NIDA, is a good resource that has information on the drugs, on statistics, and has tools for health professionals and educators for drugs of abuse in general. And the Drug Enforcement Agency will keep you up to date on these synthetic drugs, their drugs of concern list, the laws that are out there, and drug seizures. And then certainly I would encourage you to call your local poison center if you have questions about these drugs or if you're involved with a patient. Not only will we help you by giving you information on what to expect and how to to treat the patients, but it's important to report to poison centers. Many of the laws have been passed against these synthetic drugs, mainly based on poison center data, on the number of cases and the effects that are being called in for these cases to poison centers. So it's important to let poison centers know about these, these uh, chemicals, these products, and these cases of toxicity.